Peripheral arterial disease is extremely common. More than coronary artery disease, cancer, stroke, and HIV. And we're seeing the increase in the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease more and more over the past decade. Unfortunately, peripheral arterial disease continues to be underdefined, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. We've gone through a whole gamut of treatment options over the decades. As you remember, in the 80s, balloons were the mainstay of therapy. And then we progressed to stents, both balloon expandable stents, drug eluding stents, self expanding stents, and now drug coated balloons. However, angioplasty in itself inherently disrupts the vessel wall, can cause restenosis, and expressly implanting a stent can have a chronic can cause a chronic inflammatory response. Now, when we talk about the different layers of a vessel, it's really important to understand what are the different areas that can cause restenosis. You have the intima, which is the closest to the lumen, then the media and the adventitia. Now, as you may know, the adventitia is the main place where restenosis can arise. And the inflammatory cells can migrate into the intima media and cause restenosis. A groundbreaking study by Dr. Prakash Krishnan showed that atherectomy with removal of adventitia causes a significant increase in restenosis. As you can see, adventitial disruption will cause a 97% restenosis at one year compared to no adventitial disruption or removal, which would only cause, which only cause 11% restenosis at one year. What we also know as the more, is that the more plaque you remove, the better the outcomes. You can have concentric disease, which means disease throughout the, uh, the 360 degrees of the vessel, or you can have eccentric disease, which is at half of the vessel. Now, we do know that when you increase luminal gain by decreasing the amount of plaque to a maximum amount, then you're going to also increase and improve outcomes. We also know that patency can be improved by maximal debulking. This was shown to us by definitive AR, which showed that if you debulk less than 30%, then deliver a drug, then the drug has the ability to absorb within the vessel and patency is improved. So definitive AR shows that if you have less than 30% residual stenosis with subsequent DCB, you have 80 8% primary patency, whereas if you have greater than 30% residual stenosis with drug-coated balloon implantation, your patency decreases to 68%. Let me show you a couple of examples of lumovascular therapy. Here you see a patient with a chronic total occlusion in the left slide and severe disease distally predominantly located in the superficial femoral artery and popliteal arteries. Now, this is what we're used to, the angiographic, fluoroscopic view. This is what we're used to, where we inject dye and see a two-dimensional image of disease. Now, in the lumovascular view on the right-hand panel, you can actually not only see the plaque, but you can see normal tissue. On the left-hand side, you have the plaque between 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock with normal tissue between 1 o'clock and 8 o'clock. On the right-hand panel, you see a deep trough created by atherectomy from the pantheris device. Here you can see what plaque you've removed. Now, in this slide, you can see the operator has gone slightly into the media. Now, you would never be able to know this if you did not have lumovascular imaging. Here's another case of all lumovascular approach to a CTO. A flush occlusion of the left superficial femoral artery extending 300 millimeters. 
retrograde approach was used, there was mild calcification. Both ocelot and pantheris were used to cross and treat the patient with adjunctive angioplasty and stent implantation. As you can see, the distal reconstitution occurs right at the level of the adductor canal and post-procedure, less than 10% residual stenosis with excellent flow throughout the SFA. The key takeaway points here is that lumovascular therapy would decrease the, uh, the trauma by crossing and treating true lumen. True lumen crossing maximize treatment options and target treatment of disease areas. You can maximize your luminal gain with minimal vessel trauma. Subsequently, you can do therapy with drug coated balloon or drug eluding stents if necessary. We also know that fluoroscopy can have detrimental effects to both physicians and patients, especially in long cases. By using OCT, you step off of fluoroscopy and use OCT imaging, which has no radiation and you can significantly decrease your exposure to fluoroscopy throughout the case. This was demonstrated by a good friend of mine, Dr. Tom Davis out of Detroit, who showed a significant decrease in radiation exposure when using OCT for crossing. Now let's talk in detail about the lumovascular platform. There's two different technologies that we currently have, which is the ocelot, which is an OCT-guided crossing device, as well as pantheris, which is an OCT-guided atherectomy device. Both of these technologies are connected to the light box, which is the brains of the technology and contains the actual laser mechanism, as well as the hardware and screens to be able to visualize as you're using the therapy. Now let's deep dive into the nuances of the technology. So when we look at Pantheris, you see a cutting device. Within the cutting device is a laser, and this is what creates the OCT image that you see on the screen. Opposite the cutter is an apposition balloon, which is traditionally filled with carbon dioxide that allows precise inflation and cutting into the vessel and you can dynamically change this and decrease or increase the depth of your cut. As you can see on the right-hand side, the pantheris device is facing the media, and outside of the media, you see the external elastic lamina, or ELL, and past that is the adventitia. The seven French device is 110 centimeters in length. It uses an 014 guide wire. The cutter rot rotates at 1,000 RPM, and it's a monorail system. Now, the difference between lumovascular atherectomy and traditional atherectomy is demonstrated here. On the left-hand side, you have atherectomy with traditional fluoroscopy. You really don't know where you're cutting. You think you're cutting into the lumen, but it's really hard to know. However, when you use the OCT view, you can see that you're cutting directly into the plaque. You can avoid normal tissue and improve efficacy and safety. Here again, demonstration of the pantheris device facing normal tissue. So in this situation, you would not cut this normal tissue. You would not know this in a traditional atherectomy setting where you would cut usually in a 360 degree setting and you really wouldn't know if you're cutting normal tissue or plaque. Identify where I'm gonna be. So that is looking straight into the medial wall. I'm gonna go away from that. Identify my plaque. You see some calcium there too. It's a really nice shot of that. So, and I'm gonna inflate my balloon and I'm going to advance. That's really nice. There you see media, close, deflate. Open up. Identify our lesion, inflate balloon, and advance. Advance, advance, we're getting close, but we're still okay. 
And remember, you don't have this type of capability with any other device. Your ability to visualize, oh, they're a little close there, see that? How we got that close? Now, if I had any other atherectomy, so I'm closing first, then I'm deflating my balloon. Any other atherectomy device, I would cut right through that. I would be cutting through media adventitia and really not being able to identify my layers. And there's a trough right there. No, balloon is down. See our trough? Uh, we're going to start with light balloon inflation. And then once you advance, then you can start digging in with a little bit more balloon. And this is something you have to play with and get used to. It really gives you unprecedented control of your atherectomy. And that's what it's all about with Pantheris. The Pantheris Vision ID trial was the first trial to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of pantheris in the treatment of peripheral arterial disease. It consisted of 130 patients at 20 sites, treating 164 lesions. The mean lesion length was 7.3 centimeters, and they were all SFA popliteal lesions. The pre-procedure stenosis was 79%. Post-standalone pantheris atherectomy was 30%, and after adjunctive treatment, pre-procedure stenosis was averaged at 78%. After standalone pantheris atherectomy, stenosis was 30%, and after adjunctive therapy, 22%. At six months, freedom from TLR was 92%. At one year, 83%. And this was sustained out to 24 months at 76%. What is the most powerful part of this study was that there was no dissections or perforations and only 1% of adventitia removed. Even more contemporary study by Dr. Arnie Schwint with directional atherectomy and adjunctive drug-coated balloon implantation showed that at one year, 100% freedom from TLR and 93% primary patency at one year. This is groundbreaking data. And this is what we can achieve by removing plaque only, improving efficiency and safety. Now let's turn our attention to the Ocelot, a truly revolutionary crossing device. As we know, Crossing a chronic total occlusion in a peripheral art artery can be very challenging. We have multiple treatment options, such as wire catheter, such as other crossing devices. However, there is no other crossing device that allows us to real-time visualize inside of the blood vessel as we're crossing the chronic total occlusion. The ocelot has a deflected tip comes in a five French or six French device, 014 guide wire comp um, compatible, and it uses real-time OCT as you're engaging the plaque and crossing the lesion. The small deflection within the catheter allows you to rotate as you're crossing the lesion. Here's a cartoon description of what this would look like crossing the plaque. On the right-hand side is a real image of ocelot. And as you can see, the middle marker is the marker that you want to pay attention to. And that's always going to face opposite the plaque or opposite where you want to be. Again, the image on the left-hand side shows the ocelot with three markers. The middle marker should be on the normal tissue or where you're going to face away from. The plaque is located between 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock, and this is where you're going to face the ocelot device. On the right-hand structures, again, the middle marker is facing the normal layered structures, which is the media, EEL, and adventitia, and the ocelot should face the plaque as you're crossing the lesion. And I'm slowly advancing. There's our line there at at uh, 9 to 12, I want to keep away from that. A 
It looks good. That's a beautiful example of your EEL. You want to stay away from that. So I'm putting my middle marker on top of that. Great layers there. Thin cap at three or four o'clock. Remember, we're doing this with minimal to no fluoro. And even though we have a rad pad, I have a skull cap, I have lead on, still getting fluoro exposure. So whatever we can do to help us reduce that is beneficial. So let's bring our ocelot down to here. And I think we're through, my friends. All right, so we're gonna hold on to that. And we're gonna advance. So, you know, any non-hydrophilic wire with a stiff tip, doesn't matter what it is. I like that for getting through the distal cap. Going nicely. Yeah. And we should see our starburst here, and there you go. That's our starburst. So we know we're in the true lumen here distally, but we're still not out of trouble. I want to make sure that our wire is going freely before we celebrate. All right, and it is going freely. Connect 2 taught us a lot about crossing chronic total occlusions with OCT. It consisted of 100 patients at 14 sites. Mean lesion length for the chronic total occlusion was 166 millimeters, and they all consisted of SFA and popliteal lesions. Crossing success was 97%, and freedom from major adverse events was 98%. Now, what's very powerful is the fact that the luminal crossing was 93% of the crossing and only 7% was subintimal. And we know this because we can visualize as we're crossing. And you can't do that with any other technology. Now, why is that important? Some people would say, well, who cares if I'm crossing luminal or not? Well, it is important. And we know by this study that shows that if you cross luminally, you have significantly improved TLR than if you cross in a subintimal plane.